you can hear me. I have no idea if you can or you can't, but we're here for Teresa's weekly wraparound. So I'll let her explain what we're doing. So tonight we are going to be talking about behavior management strategies. Now, neither Dusty or I are really big fans of um, timeout, but if you're going to use timeout, we want to give you some strategies, some things that will uh, make your time out more of a time in and maybe a little more productive instead of just putting them on a chair or or putting them in a the corner or something like that. So no, because if you, <laughs> if you put them in a chair or in a corner, what are you doing? You're giving that kid extra time to figure out how to do it again and not get caught. Exactly. So with that being sure, said, working. we're going to show you a few um, tricks that we've kind of learned from other people, some teacher tricks of Dusty's and um, some things I've it's gathered really from um, Pinterest. And so um, I'm going to show you just one of the things that I learned um, from my daughter when she was in kindergarten. And she was put in timeout. And I have a lot of daughters, so I, I will protect the guilty by not revealing which one. <laughs> so, um, so this was what the teachers did. They had a bottle like this. This is just a, a water bottle. And they had filled it up with pom-poms. Now, they used a lot of different colored pom-poms. Um, and they put one white one in the jar. And, they, and then they completely filled it up. And so when she was put into timeout, she had to get the one white one out. And I was amazed at how focused she was as just a little five-year-old as she was sitting um, in her little chair having to find that, that one white pom-pom. <laughs> so let me show you what that looks like. So I'm putting all the pom-poms in here. I realize I'm not that close to the camera. But so now this jar is all filled up with pom-poms, but you can see there's one black one. And so that's what the child has to get out. And it doesn't work if they shake it it doesn't, they don't pop out. So the only way to get these pom-poms out is one at a time. And they have to stick their finger in like this. And they have to start pulling them. How cool is that for fine motor? <laughs> and for me? I wonder if I, get, if I sit at the meetings and I do that, you think I'll get in trouble? <laughs> well, what it does is you really can't focus on a whole lot of other stuff while you're doing it. So if a child has dysregulated, maybe there's something they're just really upset about, putting them into a, a timeout spot, this doesn't feel like a punishment as much as it feels like a challenge. And so you say, okay, you're gonna go sit over here for a few minutes, and as soon as you can get that black one out, so it's starting to come closer, but the more I shake it, see, it seems like the black one moves up. So that strategy isn't that effective. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna keep pulling and keep pulling, but just the, there's a little sense of victory that comes when you take a challenge, even if it's little, there's a little sense of victory um, when you accomplish something. And so it can really change the situation that they're dealing with. And it can help those big emotions to calm down a little. Well, and when kids have trauma, they tell you that you want to give them something sensory. If they're having a trauma reminder, especially, um, and this way it brings them back to the here and now, I would think that this is a good way to do that. So that it, yeah, well, you got it. Because <laughs> you're cooler than me. I'd still be like, my fat fingers won't work. <laughs> I, I got it out, but... You can see it took a few minutes for me to get that out, and uh, and it took a little bit of concentration. It was kind of hard for me to talk while I was doing it. So then when they get it out, you can tell them, okay, stick all the puff balls back in, and then you're done, and you can go back outside and play. Um, that, that might take longer for some children, and it might take um, less time for others, but it does give them something to do in their time out time instead of just sitting and pouting or sitting and plotting as, as, <laughs> as I would have done might be doing. So. <laughs> I would have also been the kid that would have been mad at that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would have helped me channel my anger. I'm a thrower. I tell all my parents in um, foster parent training um, that I just I like to throw things when I get angry and I have to like make sure my phone is not um, you know, available. Oh, hey, so we have some people watching, and Kim Jackson just asked, are foster kids only allowed to be pleased with heterosexual couples? No. The 
federal law doesn't allow that and we wouldn't want to do that anyway because we all know people that are same gender attracted that are just fabulous parents and so no it anyone can um, serve as a foster parent if they pass a background check if they take the right amount of training that's required for the state or for the agency and if they um, have a safety audit of their home and comply with the state laws that are required in their state um, they can become a foster parent thanks for asking that question um hi Dre, i love you too <laughs> you're awesome i'm making uh, crafts um so i think what i always tell people is that um you know in essence you need a bed and a dresser and a lot of patience and a sense of humor and um you know, you have to pass a background check and be a certain amount over your income level. And um, I can't talk and make crafts at the same time. <laughs> um, and I think, I think the biggest thing um, I know, at least you and I, because I know you, you're a foster parent, and I was a foster parent. Um, I am a foster parent. Um, I think that uh, I think the patience, but I think you have to have a sense of humor, right? Like I would have been the kid that would have taken this, and I would have been like, "This is stupid." And I chuck these across the room. And my mother, if you're watching, I'm sorry for, you know, 20 years of my life. But um, I think that these are good tools. This can't hurt anybody. This can't, you know, uh, affect anybody. I mean, what are you going to do, box somebody with that? So, even, and, and, and it, it gives them something to do. Even then, it's plastic. And a lot of the strategies that we talk about tonight, they won't work for every kid. And they won't work every time. So it's just having a toolbox. Sometimes you'll need to have um, an activity for them to do. Sometimes you'll need a story. I'm a, I'm a big um, proponent of whenever you're dealing with a big meltdown issue with a child to stop and have a snack. Uh, it doesn't have to be a treat, but stop and have a snack. I've noticed a lot with my children that if, they're, if their brains are in a place where they're, they're low in sugar or if they're um, just that hungry feeling, then it makes it really hard to have a productive time out. I can, I can punish them, but that's not the same thing as discipline. And so they're not actually getting anything out of that other than just being put into a, a, into a prison type setting. And that's not really what we're trying to do. So I, I'm a big proponent of saying let's stop and get you some Hi Dave! Um, I want to answer another question. Um, somebody says, what are some of the challenges of working with biological parents? And that's probably my favorite question because um, our children, we adopted two children from foster care 13 years ago and our children's birth mother uh, was not healthy at that time. She was she was caught deep in addiction and and all of the problems that come with that and so there, there were problems with the law and um, just her lifestyle was not healthy but when we took our training we were told that it was in the kids best interest if we could maintain some contact with their bio family if it was appropriate and healthy to do so so we chose to do that and our story is um, kind of remarkable and amazing but um, over time uh, over 11 years, um, she checked herself into rehab and now she is clean and sober and she actually rescues women who are caught in the same cycle of addiction now. And so last year in our state, um, several um, dozen babies were born healthy, clean and sober because of her efforts now. And so, so our story has a happy ending, but I kind of want to go back a little bit. During the interim, there were some difficult times. Um, Sometimes she wasn't able to show up when she would say that she was going to show up. And that was really heartbreaking for our kiddos. And um, we had to learn how to balance that. Um, sometimes she would ask us for money or ask us um, for help in solving some, some of her problems. <coughs> and um, that wasn't allowed. Um, that was part of our um, instructions when we did our foster parenting training and our adoption training, they said that we were not allowed to give her money. And so we stuck to that. And um, But that was awkward because there were times that we wanted to help out, but we couldn't. And so, um, so we didn't. Um, 
we didn't have a, a problem with violence. We didn't have a problem with sexual abuse. Um, once in a while, she would ask for uh, visitation things that were outside the limits. And we would have to kind of uh, pull it back and find a way to accommodate what she was wanting to accomplish, but do it within a way that was court sanctioned. And so, uh, so that can be awkward when they'll ask you maybe, well, what if we just happen to meet at McDonald's at the same time? Will that be allowed? And and you really can't. You have to follow the court order and, and do what they what they ask you to do. So those are some of the challenges. Um, there are certainly lots of others when you're dealing with something that's maybe more um, more aggressive. Maybe somebody that's that that is more manipulative or maybe um, that's actually a danger to the child, either their mental health or their physical health. And so uh, definitely in those times, I would lean on the advice of your social worker, your agency, if you're working with an agency. Um, I would definitely lean on their advice to make sure that you're keeping the children safe mentally as well as physically. So I hope that helps, Kim. Uh, I think one of the things that I struggled with, because we had two toddlers, and so one of the things that I struggled with was just my expectations of mom were higher than mom was able to reach. And so, um, it, you know, it broke my heart for her because she needed some resources and she needed some help and she needed to break some patterns. Um, you know, and, and, and I don't know if she has right now, but I think it, you learn a lot. And I think there's a certain amount of grace that you have to give to, to parents. Um, sometimes all you know is what you know, and you don't know until you know. Um, all right, so we've got Sean says hi. Sean Bishop, he says we're two of his oh. favorite lady. <laughs> hi, <Sean. laughs> um, hi, Kathy Taylor says hi. Um, and Dave's on, and he says, we're looking great. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. So, hi, Dave. Um, and then, um, just hi, if we missed anybody, um, I've got it on my phone. The computer has a little bit of a lag, and I'm lazy, and I'm not getting up. But, um, yeah, if you guys have questions, ask us. Um, I think one of the things that, um, you know, that we... We, we try not to glorify um, ourselves as foster parents. You know, it is a lot of work and, and it requires a lot of um, different things. But I think at the same time, there is a, a certain amount of, of just patience that you have to have with every part of the situation. You know, um, we're not perfect as foster parents. <laughs> uh, so we're actually thinking of starting a separate vlog of, of foster mom fails. Yeah. Because we, we have a lot more material um, that we can fit into in hours um, for our foster mom fails. But I think um, I want to talk a little bit about those expectations because um, mine were too high of everybody. They were too high of myself. They were too high of the system, too high of my children, and too high of my uh, my children's birth mom. And so uh, that set everybody up for failure. And so um, that's one of the reasons why now I have these kind of behavior management tools, because I, I really didn't expect my children to make mistakes. I expected that I could sit down with them and I could say, now that's not nice and we want to be kind. And my children would say, why do I want to be kind? I, I want the thing I want. I don't really want to be kind. <laughs> and, and that would kind of throw me for a loop because I, I, I thought, oh dear, what am I raising? I'm raising sociopaths because they don't <laughs> want to be kind. And, and so I would get just, um, you know, I was kind of too perfectionistic. I'm sorry. And, and I thought, um, I, <laughs> I, just, I just felt like um, I was, uh, I must be doing something wrong or, you know, why, why aren't they getting this? Well, they were little and they were children and they don't get it. And they, um, and I needed to slow down my expectations for them so that I could meet their needs better. And so to my kids, all six of them, I'm just really sorry. And I think oh. that in the future, I'm going to be a really great mom. I'm sorry you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. All right. So Janet Powell says that it's good. She said giving grace because you never know what the underlying issues is. And then we had a question. Um, Amanda says, were you ever scared? Court sounds scary. Who helps you with that stuff? Um... I don't really have a lot of 
experience with court. Now, I know that your social workers, your case managers, if you're with an agency or with the state, um, that you can lean on them. Um, the kids have GALs. I have a phenomenal GAL. Um, currently, um, she didn't even have to be in court the other day, and she showed up in, like, jeans, and she's like, I'm here in an unofficial capacity, and I was like, I love you. Um, and um, I think that the, the scared part, um, oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm scared every day. I think you're scared naturally as a parent. Um, I think, you know, are you going to screw these kids up? Are they going to grow up to be sociopaths? You know, like I always worry that I don't do enough or I do too much or I'm too overbearing or I'm not overbearing enough. Um, is my work schedule interfering with my kids? Um, so, yeah, I think there's just normal kind of human scared. You know, uh, it's not like my phobia of ice cream trucks scared. Yeah. That's 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 a whole other level. <laughs> Do we need glue? Like I need glue. Did you yeah. steal it? I was. And I think these peel off too. What? And I think they're sticky on the back. Oh no. So, okay. um, but um, on on the scared question. So there were times. Um, I remember when our social worker set up our first meeting with um, our kids' uh, bio mom. I was really scared. I didn't know what to expect on the other side of that door. And um, I didn't know if she'd be angry or hostile toward me. And and I walked into this room and I saw a mom that was really tired. Um, she was really beaten down by life. And um, that other comment about it's always good to give grace because we don't know what the underlying issues is. Well, our children's birth mom had been through um, hell her whole childhood and her life was really, really hard. And so when I met her for the first time, I was frightened. But when I got in there, I saw, I, I just felt sorry for her that she had been through so much. Um, she wasn't ready yet for help, but, um, but I didn't feel scared of her anymore. Now, when we would start to do some activities together where we'd, we'd meet and have birthday parties or, um, We'd have dinner together and meet somewhere, um, and she would bring some of her partners. That was a little scarier for us because we didn't know them. We didn't um, we didn't know what their background was, so that was a little scary. It was definitely outside of our comfort zone. And um, there there was a period where our children's birth mother was in jail, and we took the children to visit her there. That was scary for me. Um, I that was not on my bucket list of <laughs> things I wanted to do before I died is go to jail. Um, but um, but it was it was a good experience. I learned and I grew from it, and um, and then I wasn't scared anymore. Uh, it was never scary going to court. Court was more irritating than scary because um, the court process is so slow and. So you, everybody will show up. The judge is there. The bailiff is there. The the two attorneys are there. The court appointed special advocates there. The adoptive parents are there. Even the bio mom is there, and we're all in the room and trying to get something done. And then they'll continue the case to for another month out. And so everybody takes you know we take time off work again. Everybody gets in a room again, and then they'll say, oh well, this paper didn't get filed, and so they will um, continue the case for another month. And so when that goes on eight months in a row, it can be very frustrating and, and you can get really irritating, irritated with a system that could have solved something eight months ago. But it's important that the courts take their time and make sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed and that the procedure is followed so that there isn't a problem later. So I learned to have some patience with the court system. It's it's frustrating um, when they're missing one document and we're all in the room and we can't get this done, you know. But um, but I never felt frightened to go into court. Everybody there really just wants to help the kids, and so it's just frustrating when there's legal rules that slow things down. I'm stealing two of your so. pom-poms. <laughs> Get them out. So I'm going to show you um, another another thing that I was making. Um, this is a um, it's just a glitter bottle, and I hope you can see it there. It's kind of far away. So um, you just shake it up, and this is a really great thing for teaching children about their brains when they when they get frustrated or angry. 
it's like their brain gets shook up and all of those chemicals that are in their brain are flirting around and swirling around and it makes it hard for them to make good decisions it makes it hard for them to process and so you can make one of these bottles with um water and some glue so i'm going to show you this is i feel like vanna white <laughs> so <laughs> all of these things today were just purchased at walmart i wish that they would give us a some sort of a plug or a donation since we're <laughs> plugging them but um, we're not but um they're just all these things are purchased at walmart and so glue. what i did is i filled this bottle up uh, about halfway with warm water and then i poured in some of that glue probably probably a, a third of that bottle of glue and um, then I sprinkled in some tubes of glitter, just bought a couple of different tubes of glitter, and I sprinkled those in. And so you can see now that the, the water is just about clear, and so the glitter has settled. But it takes a few minutes for that to, for that to happen, and especially if you get it swirled up really good. But um, you can um, have the children hold the glitter bottle. And you can say, okay, how angry are you right now? And they can show you I'm this angry. <laughs> um, they can show you I'm this angry. And they can watch that glitter swirl around. And then you just teach them to just sit still and take big breaths while they wait for the glitter to settle. You can teach them the square breathing where they breathe in and then hold it and then uh, breathe out and hold it and um, they can do that while they wait for that glitter to settle. And as they're doing that, they actually get their heart rate back down to normal. They get their breathing rate back down to normal. And then their head can clear. You know, the, for, for most people, the calm down time that we need to actually go from um, our dysregulated state back to normal is actually a 45-minute cycle. And so... We don't usually think of that. We certainly don't want to put a child into timeout for 45 minutes. That That's too much. But what you can do is you can plan for that cycle. You, you have a baseline of a child is doing great, and then they start to get accelerated. Something's upsetting them. And then it gets a little higher where they, they're starting to get out of control over it. And then they reach this fever pitch where things are, are um, out of control, completely dysregulated. That begins this descent process. Most children can't maintain that high level of dysregulation for very long. It takes a lot of energy and calories to do that. So once they crest over that, they'll drop down, and now they're actually below baseline. And so there's kind of an aftershock effect where they're a little depressed, they're a little worn out, they're a little tired, and then they have to come back up to their baseline level where they're feeling normal and regulated again. And so if you plan for that cycle and you know it's going to happen, you can provide supports for the child throughout each step. If you know a child is, is just beginning to accelerate, you might try something like this. You might try something like the pom-poms. We have other activities that you might try. If they've already gotten to that, that crested state where they're completely in a frenzy, it's probably not the best time to hand them a bottle full of pom-poms. You're probably going to get whacked over the head that and so there's different strategies that you would use at each stage of that dysregulation cycle well and I am how old am I I'm 43 years old and I have some anxiety as some of you watching know about being on camera and I'm literally <laughs> I am sitting here um Teresa gave me these uh foamy things they look like this apparently they're sticky too um, they're foam sheets of foam and we cut out different shapes and she bought glitter shoelaces, which she may not get back. And, um, you know, we just poke some holes in it and I'm, you know, I'm playing with it like a four year old would lacing and unlacing and lacing and unlacing. There is a certain sense of calming to repetitive activity and things that you have to work at. Right. You know, um, and, and, you know, we, we should probably point out that this doesn't work all the time. It may right. only work some of the time and it'll work with some kids and not, you just kind of have to figure out what works for them. I taught young kids for a long time and, um, 
kids enjoy doing things. They enjoy being productive. They enjoy a schedule and they enjoy, you know, different types of activities and they like having input too. You know, so maybe what is your shape? You know, what should that look like? Right. So you can give them um, one of the squares and you can just cut things on the outside and they can color in the middle. And, and then they can just sew it however they want to do it. Um, or they can cut out a shape of it. This can be a fun family activity to create these activities together when they're not dysregulated, when everybody's feeling calm and say, what are the tasks that we're going to have, our little time out tasks? Um, something else with each of these tasks is that a child can see that it's finite. When you set a timer for a child, they really don't have that great of a concept of time. And so 60 seconds when they're in time out can seem like eternity when they're um, playing with their friends and they've been playing outside for nine hours and you say, <laughs> please come in, it's time to take a bath. And they say, I just got outside. And <laughs> you've been out since, you know, Dawn. Later, you know? And, and so, um, so they really don't have that great of a sense of time. But when you shake up glitter and you say, I can tell when all the glitter is um, going to reach the bottom. And I can also, um, I can, I can watch there's progress being made. So even though I know I have to wait till all this glitter falls down, I at least can see that it is falling. And so there, I get this sense that there's an end to this, you know, um, to this activity. And so it can be helpful for children who don't always understand time. And when you're dysregulated and angry and frustrated, you really don't have that great a concept of time. And, and so, um, uh, things tend to be in slow motion for you. And so um, having something that has an end in sight can be helpful. Um, All right, what else do you have? Okay, so I found... I made a peek. <laughs> I love the tail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of my, you know, four-year-old skills. Yeah. <laughs> we may start a crafting show now. Yeah, and I'm at an art festival, and I'm super excited. <laughs> Um, so, also at Walmart, I found this little package of um, wooden beads, and they have really great words on them. They have um, gentle and friend, they have forever and special, they have like and play. So, th this is just a whole bag full of beads um, that kids can um, pick out. And so, when a child is feeling angry or frustrated or mad, and let's face it, our kiddos have a lot to be mad about. Um, when they're feeling that way, sometimes it's helpful to let them write those angry words out. And other times it's helpful to give them better word replacements. It's not that we're trying to whitewash their experience, but sometimes it's helpful to get them to focus on something that's a little more joyful than um, whatever the, it is that they're angry about. So you can you can set this up any way you want to. You can have them make bracelets, or if you want to reuse the beads more than once, you can say, look, I want you to put 10, uh, 10 things on this bracelet, and I want you to give me one thing that goes with each one. So I, I've put the word friend on this side, and I've put this, this um, little guy um, sticking his tongue out. So I, I would say, okay, so this friend, this reminds me of Dusty because she's always there for me, you know, and so, and this little one with the, the tongue out. That probably also <laughs> reminds you <laughs> <laughs> This little one with the tongue out, that, that reminds me of one of my kids who, who makes funny faces and, and I like their funny faces. And so I can um, put any words on here that I want to, and then, and then it gives you an opportunity to talk about those things um, after they've, they've selected the ones that they want to put on there. So I put the word dream on here, and it's my dream to take my kids on a cruise someday. So I would, I would explain that, you know, to, to them. So these are things that, again, it's not necessarily time out when they're back in a bedroom, um, you know, on, on a device or, you know, just sitting in their bed plotting their revenge. Um, they're sitting next to you in the kitchen, so you're still, 
you know, getting dinner on the, on the stove or you're still grading homework or whatever it is that you've got to get done, but they're staying near you and they are working on something. Again, this is finite, putting 10 beads on a, on a, um, on a, what are these called? Pipe, pipe cleaner. cleaner. 10 beads on a pipe cleaner. This is not a long task. And then just explaining 10 positive things uh, is, is also not a long task. And then timeouts done and they're back, they're back calm again. Um, that's, that's the goal. So Amanda says, I'd like to do an activity like this, but do you think a teen would like that too? So I have spent the better part of the last 10 years um, working with teens, having teens in my house, mentoring teens, um, talking with teens. I just feel like my whole world, except for my three months of toddlers, has been teenagers for 26 years, which is really a long time, but not that <laughs> at all. Um, so what I've learned about teens is that um, teens spend in, in invariably too much time on cell phones and on computer games and on the Xbox and where some of those things are absolutely appropriate. Um, there are times when kids just like to be kids, even as a teenager, they like to get dirty, they like to create, they like to paint, they like to draw, they like to make stuff with glitter, they like to, you know, pretty much do any of, they like to garden. Um, if you give kids the ability to have freedom to be creative, they're going to be creative. Um, whether it's in the garage with a set of drums or, you know, in the basement with scary dolls, because that's currently what's going on in my house, what goes on my house anyway. But, um, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of teens um, in makeup and, you know, at, at different carnivals and haunted houses and festivals and things. And they, you, if you give them the tools, they'll create. You just have to let them figure out what to do with it and how to do with it. And I think that that speaks to a certain um, sense of independence as well. I'm not going to sit here and watch you do it unless you really want me to. My teens would think that's creepy. Um, but at the same time, I I'm going to celebrate what you create, you know. It's probably better than my pig. Right. I mentioned right. my pig. Right. So. And, and I, I have to agree with that. I've had a teenager now for 17 years. So I have six children and, and somebody <laughs> has been it. a teenager for another, uh, for 17 years. And they might protest that, oh, this is for babies and this is dumb and I hate this. But it still has the same effect on them. Uh, if they're sitting down and they're next to you and they just have to get through this task and they might be mumbling and going, this is so stupid. And, and But they will do it. And, do it. And as they're doing it, they actually begin to regulate. And so it's just, um, oh, it, sometimes it's by assignment that we kind of push them into uh, regulating themselves, even if it's through a, a child's activity. I, I, I so, just want to talk about um, but some, Misty too. Misty's quote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she says, "I'm definitely trying this with the nice beads here." She says that she, she's going to make them put ten nice things about their sister. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think she got these at Walmart, Misty. So um, <laughs> I think I think um, as long as they're not throwing them at each other, you know, like you're my friend. Shh. It, so it says they are the Neon Word Beads by Go Create. So that's where those came from. So Kim asks, are younger kids easier to foster? Um, I think, <laughs> <laughs> so that's like the, I get that all the time. I, you know, I, for me, no. <laughs> like, absolutely not. Um, for me, for my home, for my lifestyle, for what I'm doing, for, for just where I'm at right now in my head, drop off 10 teenagers, I'm good. Um, drop off a baby and I'll be calling you like, what do I do with this thing? It's been 30 years since I've had an infant. Um, I, I think though, I think that every kid that comes into care has trauma from the youngest child to the oldest child. And I think that that trauma translates differently based on the age, the developmental level, where they're at emotionally. And I, I, I don't think that any kid is easy to foster. I don't think that any kid is easy to parent. Um, you know, whether they're foster children or not, I think that they're, for me, I, I can talk to older kids and, and I don't, my expectations of teenagers are way different, I think, than most people's expectations. I expect you not to 
set anything on fire, hurt yourself, hurt anybody else, you know, steal a car. Like they're they're pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> like, like here's my ex. Like, you know, you can, no felony. Y'all yeah, actually might be okay with that spending on the felony. Um, cause sometimes mistakes happen now, but in all honesty, I think that, um, older kids for me works. I think, I think I could do younger kids. I don't know. And I can see where some of my friends who have younger kids, um, I, I think the biggest thing is, is foster care is not a cheap alternative to adoption, you know, and, and, uh, you know, people say, oh, if I get them younger, you know, I can, I don't know what's the big myth. I can, it, it'll work better. Or I, I, I have, I have longer <laughs> with them. I, and not to take away from that. And I understand why people who want younger kids, but at the same time, we are, and I said this last week is we focus on the birth to 18. Um, who's going to, you know, be there for college graduation or to change a tire at 25 or, you know, for Christmas when they're 27 or when they're in labor at 29. I mean, it, there's this whole lifetime. And I think that there are so many older kids that, that really deserve that chance. And I, I think that, um, I think it just depends on the person. Opinion. Well, I, mean, um, I think, I think it depends on you the had younger kids, it, though. it depends on the kid. It depends on the parents and it depends on the season of life. So my husband and I adopted two children um, that were age three and age six, and we did that 13 years ago. So I was a lot younger then, uh -huh. and um, and my kids were younger. So um, so that had its own complications because at, at that time I had I had a few teenagers, and my youngest child was nine years old, and so we went backwards to we had gotten everybody potty trained and everybody could ride a bike and everybody knew their phone number and their address. And so that, there's a certain season of life that comes with that where there's a lot more freedom. You know, everybody was tall enough to ride the rides at wherever we went. Um, <laughs> but we went backwards and we went back to adding, you know, a little three-year-old who's just a toddler and a six-year-old who was just learning how to read. And so, um, so that had its own set of things to juggle. Um, not, not bad, just that had its own set of cute things that came with it, and it came with its own set of challenges. I think it's a toddler proof. <laughs> like, like I had to, I got a call from the toddlers, and my house is not, not toddler proof. Yeah, and exactly. three days later, I had a toddler in the refrigerator. Like, I, like I heard the fridge open, and I was, and I'm literally making pasta. My kitchen's not that big. And I, like, turned around, and she's sitting in the refrigerator. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you wouldn't know I raised four kids. Right. <laughs> and you, you, over time, you sort of, you mature out of whatever season that you were in into your new season. So on um, Sunday, I got to go and spend some time with some girls in foster care, and, and some of them had um, babies with them. And so I got to play with babies, and I went home, my back was killing me because <laughs> all of my, my, my baby muscles of, you know, <laughs> holding babies and diaper bags and shuffling them from hip to hip and all of those skills it's not that i don't have them it's just that they're kind of rusty well, <laughs> so i had to, to dust them off a little i know that you know i stood in target the night before we got the toddlers and i mean i'm a very educated very well-rounded human being and I, I about had emotional meltdown trying to pick one of 75 sippy cups like <laughs> um you know but at the same time i'm currently like if i got a kid that's growing to college and what laptop do i get so um what information regarding the child's trauma is appropriate to share with school staff <laughs> can I, I would think that that is a case by case social worker therapist site director psychologist decision you know i mean i think that some of the trauma i don't know i mean because there's confidentiality but at the same time school officials are bound by confidentiality so i don't know the answer to that um, I, I do have some answers. I, I do have some answers on that. You, you need to provide that um, that teacher and that um, the school staff whatever information to keep the child safe, safe, as well as to keep the other children in the school safe. So if the child has a 
has a history of sexually acting out on other children, it would be important for the teacher to be aware of that so that she could make sure that there's always group activities, that they're not sent, you know, in isolation um, with just one other student. And so that, that keeps that child safe, but it also keeps the other children in the classroom safe. It is not necessary to alert the PTA president and the school cafeteria and, and put that out on Facebook that that child has a right to some privacy. And, and something that we sometimes forget with these little children is if they are sexually acting out or if they are aggressive, th that is not them telling us that, that they're bad kids. That's them telling us this something bad has some, happened to me. And so otherwise they wouldn't know these aggressive things and they wouldn't know these sexual things. And so the best response is compassion. And so we um, have to be careful um, what we share, even with our families, they don't need to know every detail. That what would you want shared about you? If this was your life, would you want everything that had ever happened to you? There's kind of a victim shame that um, we have in our culture. And so this, this is why people don't come forward and say, I got mugged, because there's like, I'm embarrassed because I got mugged. You didn't do anything wrong, but you still feel embarrassed about it. And so for our children, they feel the same way. We, we want to protect their privacy as much as we can, but also um, keep them safe as much as we can. So share whatever information is necessary um, to just to do that. Well, and I think in Kentucky, too, and I'm, I have a school teacher in my trauma-informed care class, and he told me that they are moving in, into a trauma-informed focus with teaching and and you know I look back if I would have had as much information about trauma as I do now when I was teaching if I you know would have done things differently and I think I probably I know I would have you know and I think if I would have known more of the story um, I, I had some kids in my class that had trauma and and it, it's very hard to relate to kids that have trauma if you don't even know a little bit you know and they right. plop these kids in your class and and sometimes you know Misty said hers um, you know, transferred over with school notes, but sometimes that also sets kids up for being the bad kid, and and they're not. They're they're kids that have been through trauma, and bad things happen to them, and they don't they don't get to be defined by that. And and so I think as a former teacher, I would have liked to have known. I think I would have had a much better understanding of how to teach the child that was in my class because trauma adds a different level on how to work with these kids. You can't. Every kid you have to teach differently, but at the same time, this adds even more to that. And sometimes you can share things with the teacher and with the school without violating the child's confidence by, by simply saying something like, um, this child is in foster care. Most of us realize that if a child in foster care, there was trauma. rounds to make that happen. Um, Occasionally, um, things are still being investigated, but for the most part, by the time a child is in foster care, there has been sufficient grounds for that to have occurred. And most of us can fill in the blanks as to what that might have in included, you know. Um, it might have included um, some physical abuse. It might have included some neglect. It might have included some substance abuse in the family. It might have included sexual abuse. We can fill in the blanks a little bit on that. So if you're meeting with a teacher to, to, or, or the school principal to talk about your child, you can say, this child um, is staying with us and he's this child in foster care and um, it's best for this child not to play unsupervised. Now you've not disclosed all that's happened to that child, but you've you've given them a, some understanding um, of things that they need to be aware of. You'll need to maybe say this child has some uh, tendencies to dysregulate, where if they get frustrated or if another child is picking on them, they may not have a sense of humor about it. They may explode, and so they need to have a Space that they can go to a calm down space and, uh, or a strategy something to, to, to deal with that and we have trauma teacher toolkits too so if anybody needs one um, you can shoot the office a call shoot the Facebook page a message and we'll get that to you I know I've sent it out to several teachers um, and so that gives them an understanding sometimes teachers aren't given enough tools 
to work with kids who have trauma. And so this is just another tool for their toolkit. So if you know a teacher or are a teacher and you want that information, just go to uh, KentuckyFosterCare.com, click contact, send us a message. You can send us a message right here on the Facebook page too. So we have 15 more minutes. So you have to, you have a lot. I like those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these ones? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Oh, here we go. Do you have to make a lot of money and own your own home to be a foster parent? Nope. You don't have to. Hashtag no. <laughs> you don't have to make a lot of money to be a foster parent. You do need to be able to support yourself. Children in foster care come with child support. You don't get paid for being a foster parent. It's not babysitting money. They come with child support because that money is supposed to be spent on them. And so um, th there are some children that get a little more child support than others, and it's because we understand that that child needs more activities. They need more things to do that will keep them busy and to help them get prepared for living on their own and so um, you must be able to support yourself on your own income and so that's what that's what's required um, for you to be able to to, to become a foster parent um, also the first um, almost month and a half that a child is placed in your home you don't receive the child support yet and so that money comes later and um, so you have to you know pay for their food you have to sometimes buy them some clothing and some supplies that they need, and you have to be able to front that money. And so if you're living paycheck to paycheck and, and, um, and you uh, are struggling to make your own ends meet, this is really not the best, um, this is not a money-making um, venture for you. It would be better for you to become a, a child care provider or to take a second job because that is actually income. This is, this is child support to pay for the child's support. And it's never enough. So, um, <laughs> Let me just tell it, you. It, it's, um, what I try to explain to people is that it doesn't make it profitable, but it does make it possible. And so some people are saying, oh, I can't afford to um, take in a foster child. Yes, you can. I, I, make, you know, I make a certain amount and I can live on my income, but I, I don't have a lot of extra. Well, this this does make it possible. You can feed and clothe a child and, and you can get their basic necessities with the money that you receive in child support um, for them. So you don't have to own your own home. You can be a renter. You can live in an apartment. You can live in a condo. Um, you, can, you can own your own home. That's great. But, and you can rent a home. It doesn't, you don't have to own your own home to become a, a foster parent. So. Oh, she said that was the last question. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, we have 12 more minutes. So if you have any more questions, please let us know. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you another little activity. This one is tricky. So I'm not sure that it would work for little tiny children, but I'm trying to find an activity that, that does fine motor skills. And so um, that was something that one of my children struggled with. And so they needed activities that involved them, you know, picking up little things. And so these are just those teeny little tiny um, uh, clothespins. clothespins. And so I have a bowl full of them here. And so you can hand this to a child and you can say, okay, you have to um, put all of those clothespins on this pipe cleaner. And when you have it all on the pipe cleaner, then you're done with timeout. And so, again, it's just working those fine motor skills as they pinch the little paper, the little clothespin open, and attach it to the um, the pipe cleaner. Again, kind of hard to see because mm -hmm. it's so far away and so tiny. But uh, we're working those fine motor skills for them again, not requiring a whole lot of concentration. If you have an older child and you want to, you can say you have to do it in a pattern, you know, orange blue, orange blue, or rainbow colored, or whatever. Um, you want to do with them so you can work in you know you can say put all the purple ones first and all the green ones however you want to do that um, but it's just another little activity um, that kind of kills time that that involves more than one sense and so as you're doing this you're using your fingers to um, manipulate the uh, clothespin you're using your eyes to um, 
to put them on here. And so it's a multi-sensory task. And so that's one of the things that's, um, that can be good for, for kids to do. I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you one more thing and then I'm going to go grab something that I put away that I wish I hadn't. Um, so I printed out these pictures. Um, I just went to Microsoft Word and I went to insert pictures. This is a picture of a child that's washing the dishes. And this is a little saying about honesty and just what it is. And this one is just a little picture of kids sharing. And so I want to talk a little bit about when we're having our kids, when we're trying to get certain behaviors out of them. So if you have them sit at a desk and write, I will not hit my brother, I will not hit my brother, I will not kick the dog, or whatever. It would be I, 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 I will, 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 not, not, not. <laughs> exactly. And so when you are having them write the negative, I will not do this, this negative thing, you actually are reinforcing the negative thing. And so you don't mean to be saying, you know, kick, kick, kick kick, kick, but that is what you're doing. You're, you're saying to the child, kick, 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 because they've written it 10 times. <laughs> Even though they've written will not, will not, will not, all the other times, you've reinforced the word kick a whole bunch of times. So one, they now, have, they now hate writing. We don't really want to have a bunch of children grow up hating writing. And two, we now have reinforced the very bad behavior that we didn't like in the first place. So these are pictures of Good behaviors, these are things that we want to reinforce. So I printed those out because these can be puzzles that you can set up for your kiddos. So you just print one out and then you just start cutting it into pieces. And again, it depends on how old the children are that you're working with. This may become a 20 piece puzzle. This might become a 320 piece puzzle. Run it through a paper shredder, <laughs> me and my crochet this back together. <laughs> and so you can decide how many pieces this needs to be cut into um, for, for your child and for what's age appropriate for them. But now as they're putting this puzzle back together, they're reinforcing the thing you want to see more of. So if, if, if they're um, getting a, a consequence or if they're getting a discipline because of not sharing, then have them put together a picture of kids that are sharing. And so then they are doing something that's positive. The positive of what you are, the behavior that you're trying to see. If you have a child that keeps forgetting to do his chore, um, you can do this one. This little guy doesn't seem that happy doing his chore. You may want to, you may want to find a, a happier kid doing his chore. And you know, if you have a child that's struggling with honesty, um, this is one strategy for struggling with honesty. Now, at Miss Dusty's house, they handle things a little differently when dealing with honesty. <laughs> so I encourage mine in my house, and we can talk about that another time. But um, no, really, um, I actually have discovered that if I tell kids that they are going to get in trouble for not telling me the best lie instead of just lying, it stops them. So if you're going to lie to me, it has to be really good. Like, did you do your homework? Yeah. That's not good enough. Did you do your homework? No, because the Loch Ness Monster came up out of the sewer in the middle of school and wanted to have a conversation about existentialism. That's a really good lie. You get a pass. <laughs> what this does is I am not actually encouraging lying. I am encouraging them to stop and think about what they are saying. Most of the time, lying becomes habitual. A lot of the times it can be survival because did you do your homework? No, could get me punched you know, or hit or slapped or yelled at. And so um, it becomes a just a habitual behavior. So if we remove the punishment for the lie and we get them to stop and think, then it becomes, especially with teenagers, then it's too much effort to tell me a lie. It's your homework. Nope. <laughs> okay, let's get it done because I don't feel like sitting here having a 20-minute conversation about Bigfoot creating brownies, you know, in this gold gym. Like, whatever it was. And it works. It's, 
you know, kids who have gone through trauma become sometimes, you know, very, very good at lying or manipulating, and they have to. And sometimes it's easier to say, you know, I'm this or that, and it's cooler. Now I'm cooler, and, and I don't want to tell you anything. So, you know, a lot of what I do, it, it's kind of unconventional because it's not about punishing the behavior. It's about reteaching them behaviors that are better. And so when you punish behaviors, are you really getting the kids to think about it or are you getting them to think about it again, not getting caught doing it the next time? Right, right. So, And disrupting that thought process is such a valuable tool. That's why each of these little craft activities that we've put out here tonight the purpose of it is not to punish not to make their lives miserable but it's to interrupt a, a process of thought to interrupt a pattern of behavior and to say let's stop and change that into something different is what we're what we're attempting to do so i'm going to grab something really quickly because amanda had asked a question earlier about teens and i want to show you something Oh, you're welcome, Kim. Thanks for coming and thanks for uh, hanging out with us and asking questions. It's um, it, These are important discussions to have. And so whether people are joining us live and can partake in this or whether they're clicking on the video tomorrow to see exactly what we did, um, those are important questions to have, you know, that are available to be answered. And oh, I love so, so these are just these are just coloring um, sheets, and these are only ninety-seven cents. So this is not a major investment, but it comes with little tiny um, colored pencils on the one side, and it comes with um, the coloring sheets here for the kids to color. So these are actually really popular with most teenagers. Even boys like to do them, and so this is this is way too much to say to a child that you know go in your room and color this because this would take 45 minutes for them to do and so that's way too much but you can say i want you to go work on this for 10 minutes or i want you to go work on this for five minutes well, there's and, coloring apps too on the phone and so you can get apps that are um that's all they are they look like that and you can color with yeah them. Yeah, I, I prefer old school. I think there's some value in, in people actually putting something to a page and um, rather than using their device again, although most teenagers would, would probably think that's child abuse um, <laughs> to, to take away their device. But I just prefer... You don't take away the device. You take away the charger and let them slowly <laughs> watch their battery die. <laughs> Like, that's what I do. <laughs> like, I'm not taking your phone. You can keep it, but I'm taking that charger. Good luck. Um, one, one last kind of idea here for, um, for uh, working with kiddos is, I guess I have two more ideas, but um, is um, getting those little um, tongue depressor sticks. And then this is, again, something that you can do together when uh, the child is not dysregulated. This is, this is something that's done during a calm time. And so you can sit down together and you can write on these sticks something that they might need to do to um, make amends if they've done something, if they've broken something or if they've lied or if they've um, been defiant or something. Um, I, I think it's important to give kids an opportunity to um, restore what's been broken. Um, I took a restorative justice class um, when I was attending Sullivan University and it, I love the concept that I was learning there that kids and, and adults, they need the opportunity to make it right and so um, just putting a child into timeout doesn't accomplish that. Um, they, they, they've not really um, made anything better. And so if someone has been harmed or if the family has been harmed by something that they've done, they should have the opportunity to make amends for that. So that might be if they were rude to a sibling, maybe they will make that sibling's bed or maybe they will um, do a load of laundry for mom, or they will take someone's turn to take out the trash. So they're like retribution um, sticks. Right, so if, like that, that sounds mean though, retribution. That's what I mean, because like I was like, mm. so, uh, my kids would be mean with those. They'd so, be like, I am going to make your bed, and in your bed you're going to find like <laughs> whipped cream or toothpaste. No, I didn't say I was going to, yeah, I wasn't going to make, I made it. <laughs> so you may want to be careful with this idea. Um, or if you do it, just give me a call and I'll tell you exactly what they're going to do. <laughs> like, 
But no, I like. I think I've, I used to use something similar in my classroom. It was. It was. It, 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 it's not retribution. <laughs> <laughs> but just ways to be nice to somebody because you weren't nice to them. Like, right. how do you put the nice back into it? Right. Right. So if, they're nice things. If, if a child has said something mean, then they should say something nice. If a child has been mean, then a child should do something. So something, something to get them outside of themselves and into a, a mode where they're serving someone else is what we're trying to encourage them to do. So, and if they're a part of this process of writing these things down, they can't really fight against it later um, because they were a part well, of it. Well, they can, but they will. Right. They'll be like, I didn't write that. <laughs> so, <laughs> be like, that lie is not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I love that idea. I think you could color them too. Yeah. Like if you did like pink or purple, like, like red, orange, whatever, like right. a full green stripe. Right. And you know, I don't think it's out of the question to once in a while Hi, have, have a stick in there that says get out of jail free, you know, that, um, once in a while we just make mistakes and we get a pass. <laughs> so. I hate a lot of those. I'm like the bad kid. Like when we have meetings and stuff, I am seriously the bad kid. I'm like over here like playing. I'm like, what did you say? <laughs> so um You were at one minute. Oh, just one minute is all I have. Oh my gosh, okay. yeah. So the, the, there you go. this last this last thing is just this washi tape. It's really it's really easy to tear and um, although opening it is not. And so this washi tape is really easy to tear off. And so you can have the kids make a design and they can go big or go home on this. They can make a big design on their floor or they can make a big design on their wall. And they can take the cat to the um, fridge. They, <laughs> we're not going to let Dusty teach the no. children. So anyway, they can just they can just get this tape and, and it's bright and it's colorful. And so they can tape it anywhere. And it peels off and doesn't leave any residue or mess. And this is so. a really good way to all these little different things. I mean, from the pig to the bottle to the friendship bracelets to the sticks to everything. These are good ways to have kids make things for their spaces that identifies it and makes it their own and gives them some individuality. Like, my pig's not going to look like anybody else's pig, but this is going in my room. So now it's, but it's my room. Yeah. You know, like we all need a little touch of something that we make or create or have a part in in, in spaces that are ours. Right. So, and I, I guess that's just my point is that we want to change the way that we um, discipline instead of punishing and making it feel like, you know, you've done something wrong, so we want you to suffer. Um, instead, you want it to be, um, we want you to regulate. I like to suffer. We, we want you to have a chance to get calm to regulate yourself, and then you can begin to repair what, what's happened. So thanks for joining us, everyone. I appreciate your help tonight, and we'll see you next month. Have a great night. If you have any more questions about foster parenting, go to KentuckyFosterCare.com. If you have questions for me or Teresa about some of the things that we did tonight, more so, more so her because I've just been like a fly, um, then shoot the, face, shoot the Facebook page a message, and um, somebody will be here from New Beginnings next week to talk to you more. Have a great night. Oh, that didn't work. There we go. Bye.